With every year above the age of 40, our risk for muscle sarcopenia increases. So it is important. I actually recommend about 1% more uh, dietary protein for every year above the age of 40. So if you can spend time, you know, researching recipes that you like that are high in protein, you know, that would be another great step. Hey everyone, let's face it. Exercise science can be quite confusing and many just don't have time to sort through all the noise. So let's make it simple. If you only have 20 to 30 minutes a day to work out, how can you get the biggest bang for your buck if you're interested in maintaining or building lean muscle mass? I asked the question point blank during my conversation today with Holly Baxter. Holly's an accredited practicing dietitian, competitive bodybuilder, and fitness coach who trains with women of all ages to build muscle, lose body fat, and feel strong. In this episode, you'll learn how to build the ultimate exercise program, whether you're a beginner to the gym or an experienced athlete. It's basically a free training session with one of the top fitness educators in the game. Holly, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> So let's start by telling folks a little bit about your background and the work you do. Absolutely. So I always have a hard time kind of explaining what I do, but I, I think I've got my elevator pitch a little better these days. So I, I am a dietitian by trade, uh, but I kind of consider myself an online science educator. So I, I really try to take uh, complex subjects. Uh, I read a lot of research and I consolidate it in a really easy to understand uh, way for the general population. So I, I typically work with females, um, I guess, from a, a background perspective, um, my interests really started because of my uh, career in sport. So when I was young, I was really athletic. Uh, I did track sprinting. I did basketball. In fact, I think my mother put me in everything she possibly could. So very, very sporty. And uh, because I grew up in Australia, we don't really have a whole lot of opportunities to, uh, to pursue a career in um, you know, fitness or in, I guess, the, the sporting world, at least not like it is here in America. So I didn't really have a sport to go on to. So like you take the academic route. So what's the closest thing you can do? All right, well, I'll get a, a career or a profession that allows me to work with these people um, and that works with my passion. So I, uh, I guess, went on to open up my own uh, training facility and uh, dietetics clinical practice when I was living in Australia. Um, and then recently, so in 2017, I moved to the US uh, and kind of moved into more of an online presence uh, because I just found that working in person, I, I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I feel like I could reach so many more people um, and help so many more women, especially by being in that online space. So I also kind of dabbled in the world of uh, physique competitions and bodybuilding. So back in the day, so when I was in my early 20s, uh, and just for reference, I'm 34 now. So back in the day, um, I actually worked with a lot of uh, bodybuilding clients. So there was a year where one of my clients just kind of said to me, you actually look better than I do. You know, have you thought about competing? And I just laughed and I was like, you know, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing. Like I enjoy sport and I love having a goal. Um, and it was not until she mentioned to me that the world championships that year was going to be in Dubai that I was like, oh, now you have my attention. <laughs> so, you know, to be able to pair something that you love uh, and be able to travel, uh, that was really music to my ears. So I did my first uh, competition in 20. 15, uh, I then decided that I wanted to go for it. I had to win uh, a state championships. I had to be at nationals, place top three. I actually won nationals in Australia. And then that kind of qualified me to go and compete at the world championships. So I guess uh, since then, I've competed almost every year as a physique competitor. Uh, and more recently, I've kind of taken a little bit of a back step um, and trying to kind of embrace a more balanced lifestyle. I have a lot of different businesses uh, and companies kind of in the health and wellness and fitness space. Um, and, you know, I think I feel like I've had my time being, you know, successful in that sport. I've won a couple of world championships and now I want to be able to like give back to, you know, other people. And I also want to be able to take a breather and give myself a little bit of compassion and co permission to, I guess, you know, go easy on yourself now. Like you've been pushing and driving for such a long time. So, 
yeah, I guess now I kind of work in this space, in this field, um, and predominantly, you know, women. Um, and it's all exercise evidence-based um, information. So, yeah. Well, congratulations. I'm glad you're taking a little bit more time for yourself. And you say you work mostly with women. Our audience is largely women. Uh, I'm curious, are there specific areas that women traditionally come to see you for? Yeah, so I think for the most part, and again, probably because of my background and I guess my uh, involvement in the bodybuilding and uh, physique sport uh, and career in general, that's where people tend to come from. So a lot of women will work with me to, you know, prepare for their shows. I have a lot of amateur competitors. I have pro competitors. But I would say in the last three years, um, and there is a really important detail that I need to share with your audience because I really think it's important. The last three years, I have really uh, opened up to working a lot more with uh, women of all ages, all interests, all backgrounds that really just want to improve their health. Uh, They want to lose body fat. uh, And part of that is also tied back into, I want to get healthy. I want to feel good. Um, And yeah, I think uh, building muscle, getting strong, you know, living their best life. So the reason I say, you know, three years ago was kind of a pivotal turning point for me is because I actually had an eating disorder for about 15 years. So I I know that you've had Peter Atia on your podcast. Uh, He and I actually went into a lot of detail about that on his show. Um, But that was something that I, I struggled with for a really long time. And I I actually got into the profession that I am in today as a dietitian for all the wrong reasons. I had a lot of uh, body image issues. I struggled with body dysmorphia. Um, I had really low confidence. I uh, really just wasn't, you know, uh, I wasn't, you know, loving myself. So I I struggled with uh, bulimia and binge eating disorder for 15 years. And it wasn't really until, uh, I guess, three or four years ago where I can finally say that I am healed. But I don't know that anyone's ever truly healed. Honestly, you still have similar thoughts. I think you just get better at being able to uh, make better decisions and cope and kind of accept your circumstances. So um, I have really, you know, taken a big step back from pushing fat loss on women. Uh, I think I now bring a much more holistic, you know, compassionate approach uh, and to try and help women, you know, I obviously want to improve people's health. Yes, I can help you in the most evidence way possible to lose body fat. Uh, and I know exactly how to help you build muscle. But I also want you to consider, you know, your mental health, your psychological, you know, health, because there is so much work that we can also do, you know, in ourselves to have a better appreciation and love and respect, you know, for who we are. And what I mean is we are more than our bodies. You know, I think a lot of the work that I do with my clients is really kind of helping them tap into, you know, their, um, you know, specialties, what's so unique and amazing and incredible about them uh, and really trying to get them to kind of step into their shoes and love their body regardless of their size. So, I I sit on the middle. I think there's a lot of people that are very anti-diet community, you know, that's the literally the anti-diet, you know, phase. And then there's a lot of people that, you know, are from the Hayes community, the health at every size, which I totally respect. Um, But there seems to be such dichotomy with the professionals that are in existence, at least the ones that I'm aware of. And I don't often see, you know, a compromised opinion. And I really feel like my like uniqueness is that I do sit in the middle. I can see that you can be a bodybuilder and you can be extremely lean um, and live that life in a healthy way, but it's not common versus I can also see that there's a lot of benefits for people, you know, to live their best life. They need to let go of dieting and they need to be able to embrace other values and things that are important to them. And maybe being at a heavier body body fat percentage is uh, where they need to be. So, I kind of sit on the fence and really try to provide value in both directions from a more balanced perspective. Thank you for sharing that. And I appreciate your perspective because we live, we live in a world of extremes, whether it's politics, whether it's nutrition, whether it's fitness, uh, whether it's, you know, taking body positivity way too far on one end and taking diet culture the other direction. And, and we don't seem to be good at nuance 
or balance or what I like to, and and I get it. It's it's what I call the messy middle. It requires a lot more thought and effort for people to find that middle ground. Yeah, you save more effort. Absolutely. I wouldn't say that this has been an easy road for me uh, as I've kind of gone through my own healing journey. Uh, I remember there was a point, you know, when I kind of first realized, oh my God, I no longer am tied to this identity of being extremely lean. I was like, how am, how can I have a career as a dietitian? Who am I to tell somebody that they should, you know, lose body fat? And how dare I even give them the tools to do that? You know, I, I remember having this major internal crisis because I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. But, you know, I've certainly um, developed and expanded my ability to have a grey. Um, and, you know, no longer is it just black and white, good, bad, healthy, unhealthy. So um, I, I really feel like, you know, I at least for the clients that I'm working with, that is something that they really appreciate. You know, it's, wow, you are really logical. You are really, you know, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it's not not super, um, you know, certain, certain conversations might not be really advanced and we're not talking about science or like mechanisms of muscle growth or things like that, but it's, it's just being able to provide some logic to either side of an argument. And I think a lot of people need that. Yeah, I agree. And I promise we're going to get to building lean muscle in, in a second. But, you know, hear, hearing you speak, I think about our obsession with weight and weight loss and Ozempic. I didn't think I'd talk about Ozempic, but I'm talking about Ozempic. And the reason I bring that up is because Ozempic is very effective. It's attracting a lot of headlines. However, if you take Ozempic, and, and Peter's been good on this, and many people have been critical of Ozempic. One, they're huge number of side effects, but two, you're losing muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And And that's that's not, and we're conflating weight and health. Like what we really want here, it's, it's losing fat, excess fat that can lead to all sorts of uh, diseases we don't want. It's not necessarily what you are on the scale, but we don't understand that. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'd love to talk to that because I do have a couple of clients myself that are using Ozempic at the moment. But I, again, here's me not being somebody that's like anti, you know, you should just do this the, the natural way. Like let's, let's use diet and lifestyle intervention to, to change your body composition. Um, I, I am such a non-judgmental person. I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to choose to do that, let me at least give you the, the knowledge and the skills for how to lose weight in a safe and efficacious way. So you're exactly right. It, it results in crazy weight loss. And the downside of that is once we start losing body weight at a rate greater than around 1.5% of your total body weight per week, we really start to compromise, I guess, where that weight is coming from. So I ideally, I work with my clients in a, in a space where we're under 1.5% of their body weight per week of weight loss. So for anybody that's listening, you can do that math yourself. You know, that would be a reasonable target. However, the downside is if you push, you know, the upper limit there and you go right at 1.5, it's very difficult to restrict your calories or create the calorie deficit that would allow that to happen. So, you know, for somebody that's not taking Ozempic and they just wanted to diet, um, you know, that would be, a, that's reasonable. You're not going to compromise your lean tissue uh, too significantly if you work at that rate, but it's very difficult to sustain. It would either require a lot of output, a lot of exercise and moving your body, or it would re- require a fairly extreme calorie deficit or a combination of both. So I think with the people that are using something like Ozempic, like they need to know this information um, because you can monitor your dose, you can adjust your dose, and ideally you would want to do it in a fashion that doesn't allow you to lose more than 1.5% of your body weight a week. Otherwise, you're now losing valuable tissue. You're, you're losing tissue that is essentially what is protecting your basal metabolic rate. You know, our, our muscle tissue is one of the main drivers of our daily energy requirements. So if you are intending on coming off, you know, a medication like that, you know, at some point, you know, once you've lost the body fat um, initially, then what happens after? Because, you know, you've also now lost all this lean tissue and now we've seen your metabolism start up here 
And now after the ozempic and the loss of all that lean tissue, your metabolism is down here. And basically what that means is that your caloric requirements on a day-to-day -day basis are now significantly lower. And that gives you significantly less flexibility to eat, you know, the foods that you enjoy. It means that you may have to maintain a much higher amount of activity to maintain that weight. So, yeah, there is, there's definitely a right and a wrong way to, to lose weight. And I'm not against it. I think it's fantastic. And there are some people that absolutely need it. You know, they, their life is at risk. Um, but, you know, I, I think there are certain circumstances where we do need to be really mindful of that. 100% agree. It, it can save lives. But I think it's probably safe to say that anything that is a quick fix, there are most likely some risks attached or at least side effects. And so with that said, in terms of weight loss, it, it seems like for you, there's a pretty fine line of how much you're able to lose in a week. And if you cross that line, you're putting yourself in a position that you're probably not going to be able to sustain this. And so lean muscle mass. I think it's incredible that we're talking about it more in, in, in the mind, body, green world, which is a bit more holistic. And I think that it's also fantastic that it's not just about vanity and there's nothing wrong about, you know, looking great and feeling great. And I think it's entered the longevity conversation. Uh, if you want to live a long, healthy, happy in life, it's the science is unambiguous. You, you need lean muscle mass to build and maintain lean muscle mass. And I also think culturally, you know, I'm 48. When I was 20 years ago, this wasn't really a conversation with women. Uh, culturally, there was, you know, I think a, a view of what a, a woman should look like. And now I think that that view is blown up in a good way. It's okay. You know, we have two little girls. The first thing we say to them before they go to bed is, uh, you know, you're strong. You know, we start with you're strong. And it's okay to be strong and it's great to be strong. And so with all that said, I, I also, you know, s some of the science is very clear if I'm a woman and I want to build and maintain lean muscle mass, but it can also be quite confusing. And so let's start there for someone who's busy. For, if there's a woman out there who's busy and says, I am maybe 20, 30 minutes a day, I want to build or maintain lean muscle mass and of course lose fat along the way what should i do and and, and this is a big question and we'll, we'll 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 also split this group into i have access to a gym and i don't have access to a gym so big question but let's start there <laughs> Wow. So I think there is, again, there's so much, um, I guess, space for gray. <laughs> Everybody has, you know, a slightly different goal. I mean, some of my clients, you know, they, they're they only wanting to add, you know, one or two more pounds of muscle mass um, and they're completely content. And then it really just becomes, okay, now I just want to feel good. You know, I want to live a happy life. How can we get my calories up so I can enjoy more of the finer things? And then I have these other clients that they're so ambitious and they're like, okay, well, I want to put on 15 pounds of lean muscle and they'll send me a picture of their favorite, you know, um, sports star or, or whoever it is that they, they follow on social media. So, you know, the, it, my response is going to differ, I think, depending on the goal. But let's, I guess, create a, a fictional person. So she's obviously busy. She's time poor. She does want to gain an appreciable amount of um, muscle mass. So, I think the first thing we wanted to, to kind of touch on is like you, you mentioned, you know, 30 minutes in the gym. So I, I want to step back and look at the bigger picture and say, when it comes to your training frequency, um, as long as you are able to kind of commit to a minimum, you know, amount of volume, um, you know, how you spread that out over the course of a week uh, really matters much less. So, you know, I think the first thing to do is kind of observe somebody's schedule. You know, how are you able to fit in movement? Um, where does it fit? Um, are you able to go in every day or do you need to consolidate it to a little bit more of, okay, I've only got two days. How can I maximize those two days in the gym? So, um, I want to first make it really clear that it doesn't matter whether you go in every day for a little bit of time or you consolidate it over two days for a couple of hours in total. Um, it is, doesn't matter. There's no difference. 
So I think the next thing to think about would probably be, you know, our, uh, I guess, exercise choice or our exercise modality. So if we're thinking about, you know, building muscle, then we need to be focusing on resistance-based training. So that's often a new kind of nuanced thing for a lot of women. I know particularly some of my older clients, um, you know, 50 plus, you know, that just wasn't something that they did back in the day. You know, women just didn't go into the gym, they didn't lift. So, you know, trying to get somebody to move into this space of resistance training is a big change and change is hard. So, you know, if this is you and you've been wanting to change your body composition uh, and build some muscle, um, you are going to have to commit to something that is going to stimulate um, and I guess signal your muscle to grow and we need resistance for that. Um, start, you know, with as much as you can and realistically can do and then work on increasing that over time. So you also mentioned, you know, the goal of wanting to lose body fat at the same time. So here's the good thing. Um, when you resistance train, you are also still expending calories. So you're still burning energy. You are, And if you're in a deficit, obviously that is what's going to govern, you know, fat loss. So by going to the gym and lifting weights, you can still uh, lose body fat, but you're also now choosing a modality of exercise that actually is going to signal your muscle to grow. Cardio, on the other hand, it has this capacity or a capability of expending calories, but it doesn't have the same, uh, I guess, signaling potential to tell your muscles to grow. It just burns calories. Now, you know, depending on what type of cardio we're talking about, um, you know, you might be somebody that just does running or something that's, you know, low intensity, steady state. That really isn't going to have much of an impact on your ability to build muscle. Uh, if you're doing a boot camp, for instance, and it's a little bit more like interval training where you have got some resistance, you've got kettlebells, you've got slam balls, you've got sled pushing, you know, now we're incorporating a little bit of resistance. So that will have, and studies have shown that that high intensity, high intensity interval training can contribute to some lean body mass. So again, I think depending on what your goals are, if you came to me and said, Holly, I, you know, I'm not really comfortable with resistance training just yet. Um, is there anything else I can do? Then I would say, well, stick with your resistance based high intensity interval classes. You know, they're still going to signal a little bit, but perhaps not, you know, provide an adequate stimulus, stimulus to, you know, see major hypertrophy outcomes or muscle growth. Uh, if you came to me and said, you know, I really want to build as much muscle as possible, um, but this is the limited time that I have, how do I do it? Um, I would look at the minimum frequency that you can get into the gym. Um, and then I would say, now we need to focus on making sure that we train uh, with close proximity proximity to failure. So really that is one of the main, uh, I guess, um, uh, factors or principles for telling our muscles to grow. So again, what what I tend to see with women is that we'll go into the gym and we're a little timid uh, when we first start and we don't lift enough weight. Uh, and usually what happens is if I see somebody, you know, if I look at their program and they tell me what they were lifting for a squat, for instance, um, you know, it, I'll look at that and go, that doesn't look, really look like a whole lot of weight. And then if I train with them in person, then I will be able to add significantly more weight to that bar. So, if they were training on their own, they may have only been performing like to a training intensity and we use a scale called RPE and that stands for rate of perceived exertion. So these women are going to the gym and they're lifting weights, but they're only performing to like an RPE of five out of 10. Um, so where you need to be training in order to effectively signal muscle growth uh, and to cause your muscle to fatigue because essentially it is the fatiguing of that muscle that allows that signal to grow. Um, we need to be up around that eight or nine RPE. So trainings, when you, when you have a training program, you really need to be given a training intensity as well because if you're able to still perform, you know, 10 more reps with that same dumbbell or that same barbell, then you are not uh, effectively, you know, signaling your muscles to grow. So that's one of the things that I would say, you know, to the person that's going into the gym uh, and you're doing this for the first time or you're just wanting to be effective. So please make sure you are training close to failure. Um, I think the second thing then is exercise or muscle um, specificity. So 
we don't all have the same goals. You know, again, some of my clients, you know, the ladies will come in, they're like, oh my God, I would love, and again, we live in Florida. There's a lot of like these beautiful big Brazilian butts, right? <laughs> so, you know, some of my clients are like, oh, I would love to grow my butt more. Like, oh, have you seen this girl? So, you know, okay, their goal is their glutes. They really want to maximize their time in the gym and focus on that, but they don't want to ignore everything else. So I would say, you know, structure your program in a way that really targets the muscles you want to see improve. So for me right now, I just exclusively focus on my shoulders and my glutes. So I train five days a week. Sometimes it's three, depending on how busy I am. I'm probably like you guys listening. Uh, I'm not as consistent as I used to be when I was competing because life gets in the way. But when I do go to the gym, I know to make sure that I am training the muscles that I want to grow. I'm not going in doing tricep extensions or bicep curls. <laughs> that might be what the guys do. But for me, if I've only got a limited number of time in the uh, a limited amount of time, then I will be choosing all glute exercises and all shoulder exercises. So I would encourage the listener uh, to do the same thing. Like, is their program specific for their goals? Because I will often see, you know, programs that have been written, they're kind of cookie cutter style um, that it, that's been given to them from another coach. And their program, it looks like a bro split. Like it is, you know, back, lots of chest, you know, lots of arms. And like there's, if you look at the exercise number in total, there might be, I don't know, 30 different exercises in a five-day training split. And, you know, three quarters of them were upper body exercises. And I, I say to the client, is that your goal? Like, did you want to train your arms more? And they're like, well, not really. So I'm like, well, this program's all wrong for you. So specificity with the exercise that you choose is also really important. Um, the last thing <laughs> for this person that's going into the gym is the volume. So we do need to kind of meet a minimum viable volume. So basically what the research tends to suggest uh, is that per muscle group, we want to be at a minimum of about 10 to 15 sets per week. So that would be something that I would recommend for a brand new beginner. Um, for a more advanced athlete, someone that's been lifting a little bit longer, uh, we might see, you know, anywhere from 30 exercises uh, on that one muscle group per week or even a little bit more, like in the case of a professional. So you can see there's a range that is acceptable. So wherever you are on your journey of uh, living in the gym or hanging out in the gym, you know, that's kind of where you need to be focusing with the number of exercises uh, and sets that you are doing to ensure that you are getting enough volume to encourage or to elicit muscle growth. And it also needs to progress over time. So we have to be able to see improvements. So uh, I suggest to my clients to track their volume. So if you aren't familiar with training volume, that is your set number times the number of reps times the weight selection that you choose. So if you add all those things up, you'll get a, a large number. So what you try to do then is keep a track of what every training session uh, and the total volume is. And then I like to look at it, you know, over a, a six month or a 12 month period, we should see that number progressively increasing and it will be a much faster progression for a beginner than if you were somebody that's obviously, you know, steady state resistance trained, you've been doing it like me for over a decade. Those progressions are significantly slower because it's harder, like you're closer to your genetic ceiling. So I, I, does that answer some of the question? You know, I think it's pretty clear to everyone that how, why this can get, get so complicated so quickly and you really need to get in the weeds and there's no simple answer. For the sake of simplicity, to some degree, let's go to air squats and push-ups. Now, these are two exercises. I think about, you know, upper body, lower body. These are two exercises that anyone can do um, and your, your body weight can get you a long way. And... How do you think about, you, we talked about volume. How do we, let's just take air squats. How should one person, if they're like, all right, you know, I want to work on my lower body, air squats, easy. We, we can link to, I'm sure you have something on air squats, we'll link to in the show notes, but pretty, pretty easy. Every, people, if you're able body, just some degree, you should be able to do it. It's a great exercise. I've done air squats. How should one think about how they break it up during the week? Um, and increasing reps because you're starting with your own body weight. So for air squats specifically, you're probably going to be doing more than, you know, 10 reps. You're probably going to be taking it. And so how do you think about 
diminishing returns there? And when, how often, from, we're just talking air squats, how many days a week do I need to do it? And then how do I structure that set and knowing when to add reps and or potentially add a set? Yeah, so this is a great question. I think the first thing that I want to kind of draw back to is that intensity scale, that rate of perceived exertion. So again, if your number one goal is to build muscle, um, sure, you could get a little way doing uh, air squats. So your body still has a physical weight. So, you know, I would start by performing an, a certain number of reps. Maybe you pick 20. And if you get to 20 and it is not, you know, difficult or uncomfortable at all, then you need to keep going. Uh, I think the key here is if you are doing those air squats for the purpose of building muscle, you need to take that muscle to its, you know, complete fatigue. So that might be, I mean, if I did that, again, I'm an advanced professional at this, you know, I'd probably do a hundred plus squats before I would be able to like stop because my muscle is fatigued. I'm no longer able to execute the, um, you know, strength and contraction um, and that power output, like that would start to decline. And that is an indicator of fatigue. So, you know, how many you do, um, again, probably depends on the individual's strength. Um, but for you, all you need to do is do enough to get you close to failure. So you want to be to the point where you almost can't do any more. And this is where speed comes in too. For someone like yourself, I'm guessing, because th this is, you could do 100 like that. But if you were to say, I'm going to slow down and, and go slower, that like number comes Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So speed, absolutely. You can manipulate the tempo of exercises to make things more or less difficult. So uh, if you are trying to get like a maximum number of reps, I would probably go for, you know, a fast speed, you know, fast tempo, one to one tempo. Um, but I guess time under tension, um, and in this case, if you were going to do a body weight squat where you slow down the eccentric component, which is the component where you are lengthening the muscle, um, that just increases the fatigue so it's another way it's no different and it's certainly not better than doing more reps again all of these different training techniques whether it is drop sets um you know tempo technique changes rest pause uh blood flow restriction like there's so many different techniques that you can use they ultimately all are intended to increase the efficiency of developing fatigue in your muscle. So there is not one way that's better than the other here. So again, if you are time poor for this individual, I'd say do the fast ones uh, because that may fatigue your muscle faster. Um, if you are time poor, then I would look for different techniques that allow you to get to fatigue quicker. So that might be, I'm not sure if your audience is familiar with blood flow restriction, but that may actually be a really beneficial uh, technique for women because of our unique, uh, I guess, metabolic um, differences between men and women. We are more fatigue resistant. So we may actually be beneficial to try and incorporate things like uh, drop sets and blood flow restriction where we're kind of restricting the capillaries and the venous return so that that minimizes the amount of, um, I guess, those metabolic byproducts that can accumulate inside our muscle cells when we're doing lots of high reps under light loads. In the case of a body weight squat, we have to do a lot of reps. Um, if you use blood flow restriction bands or tourniquets on your thighs, um, that would actually speed up the time to fatigue that muscle um, because that will, I guess, keeps the metabolic uh, byproducts trapped inside the muscle. Um, and you will find that your legs are in a lot more pain a lot quicker. So again, so let's talk about this. We, we haven't spent time on this subject. So walk us through it's a band that someone puts around. So in this case of a air squat around just walk us through explain what this does. Yeah, so blood flow restriction has been around for a long time and it's actually used uh, quite a bit in, I guess, the medical uh, world for helping with people that are experiencing like muscle sarcopenia where they're, you know, going into older age, uh, lots of different degenerative type conditions where they no longer have the use of their muscles. Um, so, you know, they'll do this blood flow restriction technique and it actually helps to minimize or mitigate, you know, muscle atrophy in older people. Obviously, that's a really important component that we want to keep from a longevity perspective. 
So um, this blood flow restriction, you basically uh, apply this um, uh, a band or a tourniquet. There are specific uh, manufacturers of these products um, that sell them. They're about two inches thick. Um, they can't be too thin, otherwise it kind of uh, is very painful because it's quite, uh, you know, the pressure is quite tight. So we basically either inflate the cuff to uh, a pressure that restricts blood flow but doesn't cut it off. And what that does, and it needs to be applied uh, distal to the muscle that you were trying to train, so at the upper portion. So as an example, I could apply a blood flow cuff to the upper portion of my arm and then it is going to affect this lower portion, my bicep or my tricep. So you'll often see blood flow restriction used on buys and tries. Um, you can also apply it to the top of your thighs um, and therefore you are going to be uh, restricting blood flow to the muscle group below. So um, uh, once you've kind of applied this device, uh, it is relatively tight. You perform a set, an initial set uh, at a relatively light weight for about 30 reps. Um, and then you wait for 30 seconds. And during that time, what you're going to feel is, oh my gosh, my my, my legs or my arms are really, really hurting. Um, and it's it would be like the instead of waiting through a normal set, um, you know, where you're able to recover, imagine you've done a hard set, you get that pump. Uh, you're doing a leg extension and it really hurts and you stop. Um, when you've got the blood flow restriction cuff on, it is trapping those metabolites that are accumulating during that set inside your tissue. So it, it doesn't really ease up and get any easier. So you wait 30 seconds and then you do another set of 15, another 30 second rest, perform another 15 reps, wait, wait another 30 seconds and then your final third set uh, of 15 and then you're done. You take them off, one set, one and done. So that is an effective strategy for, um, uh, I guess, trapping those metabolites in your muscle and allows you to get to fatigue uh, faster. So I will use those if I only have 30 minutes to go to the gym. Um, I'll do one set of leg extension, one set of hamstring curls. I'll do, you know, a couple of exercises with those blood flow restriction because it allows me to get through that workout much faster because I don't have to do a thousand reps or multiple sets at one, two, three, four to, you know, effectively fatigue my muscle. It sounds like an amazing tool if you don't have access to a gym and you're time poor and trying to work out at home. How, how much do one of these devices cost? Yeah, so they're available on Amazon for $25. I actually just did a video on YouTube uh, and I incorporated these uh, not too recently. So, yeah, very affordable. Amazing. We'll link to it in the show notes. Do you have any favorite brands? Is this in the video or? It is in the video, yes. <laughs> okay, excellent. We will definitely link to it in the show notes. So you mentioned the 30-second rest. Is is thirty seconds standard for you across the board? That that is the technical definition of blood flow restriction when it comes to the training technique. So I guess they've probably been. I, I'm not a. I haven't written research on this subject, but I've read a lot. Um, and I guess in the early like developmental era when blood flow restriction was first becoming popular, uh, I guess they tried lots of different um, time, like rest recovery uh, times, and 30 seconds seems to be the best amount of time uh, where it allows some of that, uh, I guess, metabolic byproduct to leave the tissue. Um, so it's not uncomfortable, but it keeps you in this place of discomfort, and it really is, um, for the entire time. But if you, if you don't rest for 30 seconds and you start to too soon, what you would find is that you would end up not being able to perform that next set of 15 reps because your limbs would be really uncomfortable. We, we don't want that. And part of that is because there's swelling inside your muscle when you're contracting the muscle. Uh, and then if you don't recover enough, you may actually have too much swelling and then you s totally restrict and we don't want to do that. So um, yeah, that's kind of the def definition of blood flow restriction as far as the 30 seconds um, of rest, and then it's, it's uh, 30 reps followed by 15, 15, 15. And what about non blood flow restriction? 30 seconds minimum, or can you go shorter or longer? How do you view rest in general? Yeah. So again, I think I look at rest as, uh, I guess, something that can contribute or um, not contribute to fatiguing the muscle. So there's a lot of arguments, I think, you know, for and against short rest periods and long rest periods. And uh, to kind of summarize that, 
longer rest periods are needed for strength-based sports. So if somebody is, you know, really interested in developing their one rep max strength, so they're going in, they're hitting a deadlift and they want to lift it once only and they want to know what the maximum, maximum is they can do, then we do need to take longer recovery periods for our strength-specific training. For muscle growth, however, um, that's a little bit different. So uh, 60 to 90 seconds is the recommended uh, rest time. Um, 60 seconds, I guess, if you've had enough time for the, the muscle to replenish your ATP stores uh, and now, you know, you're, you're jumping straight back in. The problem with waiting too long if your primary goal is muscle growth is now that muscle has had a longer time to rest. So guess what? When you perform that next set, you are going to have to either do more reps or you will have to use a heavier weight. So again, if you're thinking about, you know, fatigue, how quickly can we fatigue that muscle? Because if this person is truly time poor, we want to fatigue the muscle as fast as possible. So, you know, shorter rest times would actually facilitate um, faster uh, fatigability because we're not resting for as long. Now the muscle is kind of going into the second or third set unrecovered and thus we are able to achieve that fatigue state faster. So, I, again, there's a lot of proponents for volume at the moment, and here's that argument, and I do want to say this. So, there is uh, a lot of information circulating, uh, I guess, social media, and there have been some studies as well um, that kind of argue that volume is the main driver for muscle growth. So, in that example that I just gave, if you rested for 60 seconds and the muscle wasn't quite recovered, um, and you know, then you perform that next set, well, maybe you can't lift the same load. Well, guess what now that happens to your, or guess what happens to your volume now? Now your volume is going to go down. So if you had have waited longer, um, you might've been able to lift a heavier weight for the same number of reps. So that is one really strong argument in the fitness community at the moment. However, there is not enough evidence to support that volume is the key driver. Um, I actually just published a book and it went live yesterday that kind of assesses like 30 different research studies, um, you know, that kind of look at our volume. And I'm also about to publish, it's probably close to being accepted, um, it's a, a study that will be coming out very soon with some colleagues uh, of mine and I. And it really kind of refutes this idea that volume is the number one driver. I'm not saying it's not important. Um, so we do need to be able to kind of rest enough to be able to lift a reasonable load. Um, and I guess an example would be like if you only rested 20 seconds and then you tried to lift the same weight doing a lunge, you would probably sacrifice too many reps. You know, you might only be able to do one or two. And then that is kind of not going to allow you to meet the minimum viable volume. So um, we, we need to take enough rest that allows us to uh, achieve, um, uh, you know, a moderate rep range, but we don't want to rest so long now that the muscle is no longer fatigued and it takes more time to get that muscle back to its fatigued state. And just for definition's sake for folks, volume equals number of sets times reps on a weekly basis. Sets times the reps times the weight that you lift. Times the weight. So if you were doing like a body weight squat, for instance, um, your body, you could use your body weight as the, the load that you've selected. Um, so that would be one way that you can track a body weight exercise. So I, I know this is, there's some debate here, but are there diminished returns after you hit a certain number of reps? And I know there's also some differences here depending on body part. You know, for example, what I've heard is you can probably go higher in reps on your legs because you're using your legs all day long if you're if you're moving versus maybe your shoulders if you're looking to build the muscle mass. Like when do you start to see is it and assuming you're you're hitting fatigue in that set, is it 20 reps? Is it 40 reps? Like when do you start to see diminished returns and you should and you say, because this is a big question and, and Okay, I should probably take it up a notch. If I'm if I'm at home, maybe I get a mini kettlebell or I 
from doing push-ups, I put something on my back, or I, I change something up because I need to increase the resistance or weight. Yeah. So it's actually really interesting. Um, and again, in the research that I was doing for my book, I actually found a couple of studies, and you're, this is so interesting to me. Um, one of these particular studies uh, had participants do, I guess, uh, an isometric contraction. Um, and they they did this for like a period of eight to 12 weeks. Uh, don't quote me on the exact number, but it's usually most of these randomized control trials are eight to 12 weeks. Um, but every three days a week, the participants would come in and train their biceps and all they would do is isometrically contract their biceps. What is it? Can you explain to people what that, what that is? Oh, okay. So isometric is basically uh, tensing the muscle um, without moving it through its range of motion. So like if you were to flex your guns, like that is an isometric contraction as long as you're not moving your, your arm. So, you know, plank is an isometric uh, exercise that targets the core. Understood. Yeah. So, yeah, they'd come into the gym uh, in the lab and they would just flex. Um, and they did that for that study period. And what was interesting that they still grew because they would have to do it um, until they got to failure. So, that's that baffled me. And then I also found some research that supported the growth. So, muscle growth was achieved in up to 90 reps. <laughs> so, you know, that that is crazy. Now, I don't think I would ever recommend anybody to do 90 reps for the reasons that we've just discussed. Y'all, that's going to take you a long time. <laughs> so, I, I think the reason that, you know, the hypertrophy rep range exists is because, you know, when it comes to, you know, efficiency of time, um, you know, 8 to 12 is really the best rep range to work in for, you know, being able to stimulate your muscle um, and also, you know, not spending hours at doing high reps. There's also some subtle differences, I guess, in the other training, um, uh, you know, your aerobic capacity. So, we, we can train at these higher rep ranges, so like 15 to 30, uh, and that's that's basically called endurance uh, rep, uh, endurance strength training. Um, and some of you that may have done some of like the um, Les Mules, you know, uh, classes and you go in with your, your weights and you do the whole track for three or four minutes and you're just repping it out. So, I mean, that's probably more into the hundreds. But, you know, if you're working in that um, uh, uh, endurance strength rep range, you can still grow your muscles. So, this is where... I, I love saying to people, you have the autonomy to train how you want to train. Um, typically, we see men, you know, doing the strength-based training, but, you know, there's no reason why you can't also do higher rep uh, range training. You know, the evidence- It's all, it's all ego for the men. The it is, absolutely. It, it, it's, all, it's all ego. And look, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'll go into the gym every now and then and I'll look down the squat rack and I'm I'm squatting and I'm like, oh, yeah, who can I beat today? So, <laughs> we all have a little bit of that. I, I've gone to that rack and the, the, I'm, I'm fortunate there's the fantastic gym called Anatomy, which is like right across the street from where we are. I'll go in there and there, there are women who crush me on the weights. But here, here's the thing. And, and this is my this is my point. For me, in my experience... Whenever I've injured myself, it's because I've put on too, I've attempted to, to do too much weight, form has suffered. This is how my back problem started. I was doing clean and jerks in college when I played basketball and I was trying to put too much weight on and I'm like, oh shit, you know, oh, my legs, I didn't realize it was the beginning of like uh, my backstory, which led to the founding of Mind Body Green. I, I had excruciating sciatica and I did it doing clean and jerks, too much weight when I was when I was in college, my junior year. I was like, oh, I have pain in my groin. I think it's like, but it, but it actually the whole leg, I, th I thought it was local. I was naive, but it was my lower back. So, but with that said, I, I do think there's something I lean towards because you don't want to, look, if you're injured, you can't work out. And so, how, how do you think about form and weight and really dialing in on that? Because I think we've all seen this. Someone's at the gym or maybe at home. They're trying to eke out the last couple reps and all this. You know, it's like the, the, the stereotypical guy doing the bench press. The legs start to go up and they're kicking and the back is up. They're trying to get it up and, you know, you're just going to hurt yourself. 
<laughs> yeah, look, I personally for me, um, and then I can talk to the research too. So I've done a couple of powerlifting uh, competitions in like, over the last like seven years of my career. And I, number one, I will say I'm so glad that I took the time to learn the correct technique for squatting and for deadlifting and for bench pressing. Um, you know, these are the compound lifts. They are, you know, multi-joint exercises. They use all of our muscle groups, basically. Uh, and when you execute those movements, you have to be able to, you know, develop core strength. And, you know, th there's so much value in having a strong core for everything that we do. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you have a strong core, like that is a good thing. Um, so I was really happy that I learned how to lift heavy. You know, I'm going out and hitting a one rep max for a squat, a deadlift and a bench. And, you know, it, it kind of opened my eyes to, you know, oh, I actually am probably not trying hard enough in my hypertrophy, my bodybuilding training. You know, I would load up the bar and I'd do, you know, all the leg press and I'd put a few pl plates on and I'd, you know, get to the end of my recommended re uh, set, uh, sorry, rep, rep range. So, I, you know, maybe I'd programmed three by 12 on the leg press and, you know, I'd, I'd finish the set. And I, I guess I realized after doing powerlifting, I was like, you weren't actually lifting close to failure, Holly. <laughs> like, I've seen what you can do now here on the platform for one rep and I can see what you do because part of the training for powerlifting is you kind of taper your way back down from, you know, 12 reps, which is what I'd been used to and accustomed to at the time. You know, you start hitting sixes, you start hitting fives, you hit threes, you hit doubles, and then you hit singles. So, you know, when I realized what I could actually lift when I was going for maximum strength, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, it really did help me and it taught me to uh, correctly engage my core when I train. Um, but it is really taxing. It is a, a spine loading exercise. Same with, you know, your, your deadlifting. So, it is very taxing on your entire body. So, you know, when I, when I look at programs and, you know, what people incorporate, I think, you know, there's a unique group of individuals that love strength training and they will probably strength train until they like die. Uh, and that's fine. Um, I, I don't know that that's for everybody, but I would not avoid strength training in your programs, um, you know, altogether. I think there's a lot of value in becoming or learning your true strength capabilities and for the, uh, I guess, added benefit of how it allows you to correctly brace and that really influences your technique for every other exercise that you do. You know, I'll even bend down to get my, you know, uh, laundry basket and now I'm like, <gasps> And I like brace like I do when I'm going to deadlift or squat. It's so silly, but like it's really taught me good posture. Um, so if you're programming your training and you're wanting to grow your lower body, you can get strong without doing heavy load training. Um, you do not have to do heavy load training for hypertrophy. Is it beneficial to do some? I think so. Um, and similarly said, if you don't want to do, you know, any of that at all, you can also work in that higher rep range. You can do the 15 to 30 reps as long as you are getting close to failure. Um, so I, I encourage the listener to really think about what do I like doing? Um, and I would also say don't, don't be afraid of testing your strength. I found it one of the most uh, valuable experiences of my entire career in, you know, this this fitness industry. Um, I won't go and do it again, as in like I won't do a powerlifting meet because it's so specific and it's just all heavy work. I've now been able to find a more balanced approach that allows me to, you know, get a little bit of ego every now and then, you know, once every six months I will start to program, you know, I'll do a six-week training block or a mesocycle that has, you know, three exercises that have, you know, sets of three. I won't worry about doing singles because I just find that fun. It's enjoyable to me. I like the challenge. I like to have a performance-based goal uh, when I'm in the gym. But my the bulk of my training is in that 8 to 12 range or, you know, the 15 maybe to 20. And I will call upon those higher rep ranges a little bit more. Uh, number one, if I'm traveling, you know, if I don't have access to any equipment, um, you know, I, that's what I will do because it is, it's not not going to work. It's just not how I would prefer to train. I can be more efficient, in my opinion, if I can get in the gym, I've got access to weights that will allow me to work in that 8 to 12 rep range. But 
yeah, the, the higher rep ranges can absolutely be effective for building muscle not the case for strength you do need to be that's like a specific skill so for strength sports you do need to practice that heavy loading because you have to develop that strength to hear you loud and clear on on the volume how ideally should that be split across the week if we're doing our air squats whether there's blood flow restriction or not or maybe we're using some kettlebells we'll use that should we do monday wednesday friday should we do tuesday thursday like what is the minimum space between in your view yeah so i always uh, refer back to the research and um if you are going to train you know your lower body for example on a monday um i would recommend and the research suggests that the recovery time or the best ideal circumstance to allow your time your body time to recover is about 36 hours to 48 hours so i tend to do um well i've done lots of different programs and again that's why there's no right or wrong here um i might if i do a lower body session on monday i might do upper body on tuesday back to lower on wednesday upper body went on thursday so on and so forth um so you know i think as long as you're giving those muscle groups a little bit of a break i think that's that's fantastic um, where it gets a little bit cloudy is if you are also somebody that, you know, has more than one interest and you're not just living in the gym, you know, maybe you like to run, maybe you do another sport. Uh, so we've got kind of competing interests and goals. So, you know, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, you have to spend a little bit more time um, kind of looking on your schedule. Okay, how can I make sure that I'm recovering enough from this lower body training session um, and also not, you know, uh, potentially having a negative influence on my run, you know, later that day. So, you know, you have to be strategic. Um, and, you know, so for the people that are like elitists, they are the most complex and most challenging people to work with. I think you're hitting on something I wanted to touch on, which is which is running or cardio. There are a lot of people who like running or they like cardio or they like, they like their group fitness class. And they're thinking, well, if I'm going to do, how do I space this out in a way I don't want to... Again, I think people, this is someone who's probably limited on time. So you don't want to in any way affect your, you don't want to impact your returns, if you will. Yeah. So running is an interesting one. So I guess out of, you know, most of the typical forms of cardio that people um, undertake, it is probably the most taxing on the lower body, you know, that eccentric loading when your heel strikes the ground. Um, so that is one of the, I guess, forms of cardio that I'm least fond of for somebody that is intentionally trying to, you know, change the shape of their legs <laughs> uh, or glutes for that matter. Um, you know, you have to use your glutes. Obviously, they are keeping you in the upright position when you're running. So, um, you know, in those circumstances, I would say I would try to time them apart a little bit if you can you know make sure that you give yourself a full day uh, before you try and do one one of them again or like before you do the, the alternative so again the example before if you've got a leg session on a Monday I wouldn't be doing a run Monday afternoon I wouldn't be doing a run on Tuesday and also wouldn't be doing a leg session again on Tuesday so you really want to give yourself about you know 36 hours off that muscle group if you can you know work that within your schedule so that would be ideally if you did Monday legs, Wednesday a run, and then Friday come back to legs or Saturday ish. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think there's again there's always um, you know a spectrum. So depending on you know somebody's specific goals, um, you know how much you know what's the volume of the running. You know when we talk about running, are we talking about somebody that just goes for a five kilometer, you know a three mile run, you know every so often for their uh, cardiovascular fitness, or are we talking about you know I've got clients right now that are uh, training for the Ironman, um, you know and she's doing like multiple hours, you know and several hours also on a bike, which is very you know leg heavy. So there's always a spectrum. Um, a lot of the concurrent um, training research where we kind of look at, okay, how much does cardio influence, um, you know, resistance training um, adaptations or recovery? Um, and it is actually not as bad as I think it was initially made out to be. Um, the downside with the studies that we do have is that they're not looking at the Ironman competitors. They're, you know, recruiting re um, participants that are doing maybe 30 minutes of, you know, running three or four times a week at a moderate intensity. So, 
we have less information on like the extremes. Um, but, you know, based on those findings, what we tend to see is as long as you leave four or so hours between, um, you know, your resistance-based training session and then your uh, cardio uh, run or whatever form of cardio that you do, as far as that interference effect, it seems to be relatively insignificant. Um, it tends to be improved if you can have a meal in between. So we're looking at, you know, getting in some of those essential, you know, amino acids, especially leucine. That's really important for recovery, um, you know, and also refueling, uh, making sure that you've got plenty of uh, carbohydrate uh, available for that next exercise bout. And then one more thing to consider as well, uh, and I know it's always been a consideration for me as a competitor because, you know, we're ultimately trying to get as lean as possible. Um, you know, if you're trying to do all this extra cardio for the purposes of fat loss, which it can do, um, you've got to kind of look at, well, how's that going to interfere with my following days, you know, resistance training? And, you know, an ideal fat loss phase would look like maintaining as much muscle as possible. So the primary goal for a bodybuilder or anyone really who is, you know, wanting to pr to focus on fat loss, not lean tissue loss, is to maintain your muscle. So lifting, resistance training needs to be the priority. Uh, and then the cardio is really secondary. Like you're just doing that, you know, in uh, for the purposes of uh, either creating a calorie deficit, you're expending energy when you're doing cardio, um, or, you know, you might be doing it because you enjoy it and it's also good for your cardiovascular health. So, yeah, again, there's just so much degree of spread here. Uh, and that's why every individual is so unique. And you mentioned leucine and we've had Don Lehman on the show. So we went deep on protein and, and leucine. Uh, but briefly, do you have a view on women and protein and leucine in terms of amount of protein per pound, I would say pound, I'm not so good on kilograms, uh, and how we think about that on a daily basis and also post-workout window. Yeah, so again, this kind of comes back to uh, one of the discussions that we often have, which is the sex differences between men and women. So um, I think metabolically speaking, uh, men and women are not all that different. In fact, if we look at, you know, uh, men and women side by side, most of the differences that we tend to see, um, if we take away their like anatomy and the changes in their physiological structure, um, we're not really that different. So, you know, proteins in that, in, the, in that category as well. So for, um, I guess, anybody, male or female, the recommended amount of dietary protein, and again, it, it, you'll hear different reference ranges, and again, they've probably looked at a different study, but uh, on average, I'm going to pick like uh, what the medium uh, study says. So it's about 1.8 to 2.9 grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass, and I know you want pounds, so one uh, gram to 1.3 grams uh, per pound of lean body mass. So the reason I like to give it in lean body mass um, terms is because that is really what governs your protein requirements, not your total body weight. You know, you're we're, we're incorporating like fat into, you know, the total body weight method. So you hear somebody say, oh, 1.6 to 2 grams per, per kilogram of um, lean, uh, per kilogram of total body weight. Um, that is just a, a less, a, a less accurate way, I guess. Um, but it's, it's also still going to put you in that ballpark. And that's the wonderful thing. It's a range. So provided that you are consuming, you know, 1 to 1.3 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass, um, anywhere within that range, uh, you're good. I'm glad you, I, I just want to stop you there. I'm glad you pointed that out because many people hear the per pound and right away say, I can't do that. And I totally get it. For example, I am six foot seven. So I'm 215 pounds. That's a lot of protein. However, what, so and I think many people have that same reaction, not because they're six foot seven, but they look at their body weight. And so I think that the call to action here for folks is do a, I think an in-body scan or a DEXA scan so they can get an accurate number because when you start to look at fat and all the other stuff. Yeah, I've seen it all, honestly. Yeah. Um, again, if you're using that general generic, you know, per kilogram or per pound of total body weight, 
Um, it just means that p- some people, again, um, depending on your body fat levels, may be underdosing in protein. Um, uh, you might be overdosing in protein. So that's why if you know your lean tissue mass, which you can determine from a, a DEXA scan, like you said, uh, it just me- makes it a little bit more accurate. Or, I mean, if you don't want to have to go to a DEXA scan uh, and spend the money on it, um, I guess like there's plenty of professionals that would be able to look at your pictures right now and give you an educated guess because uh, we've been working with clients for so long. So Sorry. I mean, I'm having to do that. <laughs> I've also, I've done the in-body scan, which our, our gym has. And I've also done, you know, a, a scale that's like $50 on Amazon. And directionally, they're kind of in the same ballpark. Yeah, the bioelectrical impedance. So that's the in-body. And then I'm guessing the type that you got at home, like with the handheld thing and or whatever you do. <laughs> yeah, the, the one in the gym was the in-body where it's you, you hold your hands like the grip and you take off everything. Yeah. They're better at uh, assessing your total body water um, because it's bioelectrical impedance. I guess it's kind of, you know, conducted through through fat. Um, uh, and then, uh, so I, a lot of people will kind of have those and they'll get really disappointed if, you know, they have another test later. I'm, this is not what we're, related to what we were talking about, but it is something that I want to mention to people because I know they're really popular and a lot of gyms have them. Um, please use those, um, and take that with a grain of salt because they are not as accurate as, you know, somebody actually going in and getting a DEXA scan. Um, you know, your total body water, interestingly, will shift significantly um you know you've only got to look at number one okay we we live in florida it's hot as heck outside right now so your day-to-day hydration status really influences that reading and it's basically a math you know it's an equation so whatever it registers as water um you know that's going to kind of show up as lean tissue um because then they will subtract the fat mass um, so if, for example, you did an in-body scan um, and then you went and chugged a two-gallon carton of milk or water or whatever, you got back on that um, same scale, it would tell you that you have increased your lean body mass, your skeletal muscle mass, by the measure of uh, weight that you consumed of liquid. So if, if you do use those, I Uh, exercise caution the absolute value is probably inaccurate but it can track relative changes and that's that's good to know you can see you progressing but it might you know that actual number may not be correct and try to do it under really similar conditions so please don't do it in the middle of the day if your trainer says after your session oh hop on the hop on the in body let's get your you know measures don't do that because you've just worked out I don't know what time of the day it is, but you've also had food and fluid. Um, you've moved your body and your hydration status and your total body water is going to change significantly. And if you've just done a really hard session, there's going to be an acute inflammatory response to that training. So guess what? Your legs are going to be swollen or your biceps are going to be blistering, you know, blazing with fluid. Um, and now you're getting a, a significantly elevated lean body mass measurement which isn't accurate so do it fasted in the morning get the first appointment do it you know the same time um so that you're kind of at least measuring similar conditions it's very sage advice so so to close the loop on training is there any advantage to full body or splits or really doesn't matter as long as you're getting the volume yeah, so I again it comes back to your goals. Um, full body training. I currently have full body programs. I don't. I, that's excluding biceps and triceps. I don't train those. <laughs> but again, it comes down to what muscle groups are you trying to improve. Um, so your program, if you're trying to grow everything at like an equal rate, then yeah, do full body or. Um, you know, you need to make sure that you're including all the muscle groups in your program over the course of, you know, a training week. So you can splice that and dice it any way you like. You could do lower body, upper body, lower body, upper body, full body, you know, if you want to keep it even. Um, You could do full body five days a week. Um, You know, it doesn't matter. Um, The exercise number needs to be specific to your goal on that muscle group. So if you are trying to maximize the growth of your chest, then when you look at your week's training, then the majority of those exercises should be focused on your chest um, and for any other muscle. So, you know, I I think that is less important. It's more about that exercise specificity. Um, 
so yeah, I, I think I hope that answers that question. <laughs> no, it, it does. It does. And to close the loop on the protein conversation, uh, is there a specific window post workout that I need to ingest that protein and maybe just spend a moment, you know, we've talked, we went into great detail with Don, but you know, you need to hit that two and a half grams or so of leucine to make, make sure the protein counts. Let's maybe just spend a moment there on the window and the leucine. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess we kind of refer to this in our world as like the anabolic window. Um, I like to refer to it as the protein refractory period. Uh, at least that's what it's referenced as in quite a bit of research. So they one and the same thing. Um, what's really cool is that the anabolic window used to be, you know, pushed um, through the, the fitness industry as being something that was extremely, you know, this narrow uh, unit of time. You know, it's like one or two hours max. Or I, I've certainly heard people 10 years ago say you've got an hour to drink your protein or get your protein in. So everyone's racing home from the gym if they forgot their shake or they're drinking it in the car. So it, it is not that um, uh, it is not that narrow uh, based on what we're kind of seeing. And as long as you can consume, you know, a high quality uh, protein source, um, that contains, you know, the essential amino acids, leucine especially, um, you know, within, you know, one to two hours either side of your training. So, like, I trained this morning. I had my protein source before I left. I just had a little quick shake because I was in a hurry and I knew I'd be busy today. So, you know, I, as long as you're consuming your protein within a, a couple of hours either side, before or after, um, you know, that tends to be, you know, the most uh, effective way to, to ensure you are getting that leucine to signal your muscle to grow. So I, I guess I want to touch a little bit on the, the, the refractory period. So once we consume like a bolus of, of protein, so again, the, the minimum amount of protein that you really want to have in an individual meal is probably about, you know, 25, 30 grams, maybe a little bit more um, depending on your body size. Um, so once you have that meal, what we then see is like a, an increase in your blood leucine levels. And they stay elevated for, you know, a few hours. It's probably, you know, around three hours that your blood leucine will stay up, but it will slowly start to trickle down, you know, if we were to look at it on a graph. So once it gets back down to zero, that is really the time that you want to have another bolus because that means that we are maximizing our time signaling your muscles to grow. So I, I guess this kind of is more a discussion around protein and protein timing. Um, so, you know, you want to avoid having long periods without protein, um, you know, throughout the day. I mean, if you have breakfast and you don't eat until you come home, um, you know, that's not ideal. What does seem to be the most important thing is hitting that daily protein amount. Uh, sometimes that's the best you can do. I, even as a professional athlete, um, you know, I was uh, raising two kids and running you know, three different businesses and trying to do like coaching and my, my bodybuilding. There were some days where I just couldn't do that. So, you know, you, you do your best. Um, but if you were to try and optimize it, I guess the order of hierarchy would be hit your protein totals every day um, and then, you know, make sure that you can consume a high quality protein source within a couple of hours either side of your resistance training and then meal timing. So protein timing every, you know, th four, three to four hours, I think is a good, uh, a good time to kind of, you know, recharge the, the signal to grow. It's like you turn the car on um, and then you've got this two hour window. Like imagine once you've turned your car on, you can't turn it on anymore. Um, but, but, you know, you have to wait for a couple of hours and then it, it shuts off and then you hit it again. You turn it back on. So you've got more time throughout the day where you are signaling your muscles to grow. Got it. So I know we're short on time and maybe this is wishful thinking, but I am very curious about this question. I have a feeling it's complicated, but let's go for it anyway. Is there something that women should be focused on or changes as they age? You know, it, is it at age 40, maybe they should be thinking about this or for, or age 40 or 60 or what have you, but we've got a wide range of women and, and look, women in their 20s are different than women in their 60s. And if there's a quick, quick answer to that. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I don't do things quickly. Um, I would say, well, yes, protein, very important and muscle, very important. Um, 
you don't need to be, you know, jacked and, and juicy, you know. I think having some amount of muscle is incredibly protective for so many different reasons. Um, and then I also think just, you know, keeping an eye on your, um, you know, blood work. Like be consistent about that every six months. Have routine checkups. Check, get a full metabolic panel for ladies. You know, make sure that you're testing your sex hormones and, you know, all of the things that are extremely important for us to thrive. Um so, you know, once you're doing that, I think from an exercise and diet perspective, um, we, number one, I always say, well, we've got to make sure that you like it first. So, do you, what exercise do you like doing? That, that has to be a consideration. Otherwise, you're not going to stick to it. And adherence is everything. So, pick some exercise that you enjoy. Um, and then if you are in a position to add in some resistance-based training, it doesn't have to be five days a week. It could be two days. I like to go into the gym and I'm doing that for my muscle mass. I also do, you know, a class, uh, you know, with a group of people. I like to play tennis on Fridays with the ladies, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think being active is a good thing and there are benefits to having um, you know, strength and muscle mass. Uh, and there are also benefits to having great cardiovascular health too. So I don't think that, you know, we should be avoiding cardio um, just because there's this big hype and craze about, you know, it's so important to have all this muscle. Um, you know, I think that's there's also a really important conversation to be had around cardiovascular health. So, yeah, I think... Uh, Start with something that you love doing. Um, try to incorporate, you know, some resistance-based training. Um, be uh, be curious about finding foods that are high in protein. I think one of the best things I ever did was actually go into bodybuilding because it forced me to eat healthy. Uh, I used to be this kid, even as a dietitian in my early years, I hated veggies. I hated, you know, I just liked the typical, you know, junk foods. And it really put me in a position where I had to learn how to cook for flavor. So if you can spend time, you know, researching recipes that you like that are high in protein, um, you know, that would be another great step. And also know that, you know, with every year above the age of 40, um, our risk for muscle sarcopenia increases. So it is important. I actually recommend about, uh, I guess, 1% more uh, dietary protein for every year above the age of 40. So, you know, my, some of my older clients are probably sitting at the higher end uh, of that protein range. Maybe it's not their favorite thing, but they also are like, you know what, this is good for my health. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work through this. So um, I think they'd be the main things that I, I would say about, you know, aging. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, well said. It feels like we're just scratching the surface, but I know you've got to run. We're short on time. We will definitely have you back. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.